In this clip we will discuss the asymptotic normality of OLS parameter estimators. Let's start with our standard model y x beta plus u and we should remember the dimensions y is n by 1, x is n by k with k explanatory variables. Now we also earlier established if you looked at the clip on parameter consistency that beta hat minus beta can be written in terms of these two terms a and b. Now certainly b is a random variable a depending on what you assume about x but certainly b is a random variable. We then use the law of large numbers to establish the following. We established that a in probability converges to qxx, that was assuming that x is a random variable and qxx was the expected value of xi prime xi, so something like the covariance matrix and b converged in probability to zero. And following from that, it was then obvious that beta hat minus beta converged in probability to zero. So we said, as n goes to infinity, beta hat will go arbitrarily close to our unknown coefficient value beta. But it may have to, you may need a very, very large n to achieve a particular closeness. Whatever closeness you could wish for you can achieve if just n is large enough. But that n may be very large. So what we now want to talk about is the distribution of that difference between beta hat and beta. After all, beta hat is a random variable, so we should be talking in distributions. And here's a little preview. We will use a law of large numbers to establish that a in probability converges to x uh, q x x, so nothing new here. Uh, we should actually here specify that what we mean by a is just the uh, term in the parenthesis, not the inverse. Uh, that wasn't very clear. So a is the just the term in the parenthesis. That's consistent with the result we established for the law of large numbers. So we'll establish that. But then we will also use what's called the central limit theorem to establish that square root n times that term b converges to something or converges basically to a normal distribution. Okay, so there is our distributional results converges to a normal distribution with zero mean and some sort of variance. I, I shall leave the variance unspecified at this stage. So I'll just say question mark. Okay. And from there, it will follow that actually beta hat minus beta, but since we have a square root n in front of the b, we will actually also have to add that square root n here in front of the beta hat minus beta so that square root n so that's a little nicer one square root n times beta hat minus beta that this guy will also converge to a normal distribution with mean zero and again I'll leave the variance unspecified we'll talk about that later we will now have to talk about in what sense we are using that word converges. Okay, so we need to basically introduce a little definition. So what's the meaning of conversion? Convergence here. Here we are talking about convergence in distribution as opposed to convergence in probability. And what is that convergence in distribution? Assume you have a random variable Zn where n indicates some sort of sample size and that converges in distribution to a random variable z without that index n if in the limit, so as n goes to infinity, the difference between two things, the in fact the absolute difference between two things basically goes to zero. Okay, so the question is the difference between what things and that will be the difference between fn of little z and f of little z. So what what are the what is this fn and f? So fn and f are the cumulative density functions or CDFs of 
our random variable set n and set respectively. Okay, uh, set n and uh, that's a little typo and set respectively. So it's the distributions, the cumulative distributions that converge, and I do that at all continuous points of that CDF of fx. I'm not going to talk about that in more detail. We will also write this as set n converges in distribution to set as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is the short version of how we state convergence in distribution. Now let me try to illustrate this uh, a little bit. Oh, first, before we do that, well, of course we have to recognize that really to make this useful set should be some sort of nice distribution. Like for instance, set should be normally distributed. And in, in fact, this is gonna be what will happen in our examples later when we talk about distributions of beta hat. But to illustrate what that means, this convergence in distribution, let's use a little graph. Here we have an excess n where the sample size goes up. Now at a particular n1, we'll have a, another axis here, and that is the axis where we have our random variable set n1, and here we'll um, draw a density distribution, so that the cumulative distribution would be the integral of this. Yeah. So let's say, that random variable set at n1 has this distribution clearly skewed. Now let's draw the same at a different, a larger sample size n2. So now we draw the density for set n2. So that could be a sample average, but now at a larger sample. Now let's look at that uh, density distribution. It's still a little bit skewed. And now we draw it at an uh, even larger n, n3. Now the density distribution for, say, the sample average at n3. And let's say now that distribution looks very symmetric. And what convergence in distribution means that as we increase the n, the distribution of that random variable set n, so if n3 is big enough, converges to a normal distribution. So this is a normal distribution, but the distribution of set n2 and the distribution of set n1 are not normal. So we need large enough n for this distribution of the random variable to converge to a normal distribution. So that's perhaps a little illustration of what this convergence in distribution means. Okay, so in words, as n goes to infinity, the distribution of set n converges to, say, a normal distribution. But it could be another distribution, but here it's going to be the normal distribution which we will um, make use of. So what we'll now do is we'll use this convergence concept in a central, central limit theorem. How are we going to do this? Assume we have a random variable set i, so that's not set n, that's set i with zero mean and variance sigma i squared. Okay, so the variance could depend on i. And then let's look at the sample mean. 1 over n times the sum of all the set i. So that's the sample mean. So the general structure of a central limit theorem is going to look like this. We will have to de impose some dependence restrictions on the set i, it turns out, plus some moment restrictions on the set i. And with these restrictions, very similar to the law of large numbers, given some restrictions, we will then be able to conclude something here. We will be able to conclude that square root n times the sample mean, I should really say set bar n, that's a sample mean, and that n indicates of how big the sample is on which we calculate it, that converges in distribution to a random variable set, which is normally distributed. Okay, and uh, let me what shall I write? I'll leave the variance open. So, under some restrictions in general, a central limit theorem says under some restrictions, the sample mean is normally distributed asymptotically for large enough n. So the first example for a central limit theorem is where we impose that the set i are i, I, id, so independently and identically distributed. So that means that the individual variants are all the same. Sigma i squareds are all sigma squareds. We also impose that the variance is finite. These two restrictions together will imply a central limit theorem, the Lindeberg-Levy central limit theorem. In fact, that's the name 
given to this. And what that central limit theorem establishes is that square root n times the sample mean converges in distribution to a random variable set that is normally distributed with zero mean and variance sigma square. The second version of a central limit theorem, and there exist many, many more, is where we impose that set i is the set i's are independent but not identical, so they can have different variances. Right? Also, that's the case of heteroscedasticity. And we will impose that the expected value of the absolute value of set i taken to the power of 2 plus delta is smaller than some value delta, some sort of value delta, but that delta needs to be smaller than infinity, needs to be finite. Right? For any of a sum delta that is larger than zero, right? for some delta larger than zero, then we can conclude that a central limit theorem holds, it's called the Lyapunov central limit theorem, and here we can conclude that square root n times the sample mean converges in distribution to a random variable set that is normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared bar. Now sigma squared bar, that is the average of all the sigma squares. And in fact, this moment restriction ensures that there isn't one individual observation where the standard deviation or variance sigma i dominates that average value of the variance. And in fact, that moment restriction, what we also need is that the average variance is larger than zero, it doesn't disappear. Now, what you have here, as for laws of large numbers, as the dependence restrictions become looser from IID to independence only, the moment restrictions become stricter. Okay, so with this in the back, we can now continue and return to our example which we have stated before, the difference between beta hat and beta is uh, the product of these two terms which you should be familiar with by now. Now you should also recognize that that last term is of course just a sample average and we will want to apply a central limit theorem to this sample average. That's the, the key sort of technical step we're going to be using now. So we will call that our set by n, our sample average we are interested in. And if that is set by n, that implies that our set i, our random variable, is the xi prime times ui. So this is a vector, but that doesn't cause any problem whatsoever for central limit theorems. If central limit theorem conditions apply to that xi prime ui, then we will be able to establish the following. Right? Then we will be able to say that the square root of n times that set, set m bar, which is also equal to, uh, to this term, uh, square root n times the sample average, and then we can cancel the square root n, so we get 1 over n times the sum of all the xi uh, primes ui's, and in matrix form that's this, right? that's just uh, all of that is the same. And that will converge in distribution to a random variable set that is normally distributed with variance sigma squared times qxx. No details of how we get there. Suffice to say that we need a law of large numbers to get that qxx, which is the expected value of xi prime xi. Now let's put the pieces together first. We shall just restate the above relationship between beta hat minus beta on the left hand side and our terms on the right hand side. So here we go. Now on the right hand side, that last term we are working with, but we need it for the central limit theorem that extra square root n, so we'll have to multiply the left hand side as well to remain everything, so that everything remains equal. Now on the right hand side we apply the central limit theorem to that right hand term and we'll find out that that converges to normal distribution with these coefficients. The first term we established previously that by law of large number that will converge to qxx inverse. Right? The bracket term is qxx and then inverse. Now it turns out that here the easiest is to apply the IID version of uh, the central limit theorem if the Gauss Markov assumption sold or if all our regression assumptions hold we can apply the IID version. We can then conclude that square root n times beta hat minus beta converges in distribution to a random variable qxx inverse set, where set uh, 
is normally distributed like this. Now let's rewrite this in terms of a new random variable r. So we'll say the left hand side converges in distribution to r where r is distributed normally and now we'll just get that qxx inverse into the variance term using standard variance calculation. So that's post and pre-multiplication. That will cancel away. So that's what we get. Okay. So that was quite convenient. Of course, that is valid as n goes to infinity. We can also state this as beta hat converges in distribution to uh, another random variable s, which is normally distributed with mean beta and variant sigma square over n times qxx inverse. Or we say that beta hat is asymptotically distributed always as n goes to infinity as a normal distribution with beta hat and variant sigma squared over n times qxx inverse. So what have we achieved doing all of this? Now, finding that beta hat has an asymptotic normal distribution without assuming that ui has a normal distribution, that was a great result. And why? Well, really we need the distribution of beta hat to perform inference on our unknown coefficient values beta. That's very important. But really, we didn't want to have to rely on the error terms having to be normally distributed because we know that often our error terms will not be normally distributed. So shedding that assumptions and still getting information about the distribution of beta hat was fantastic. The question is, is it worth anything? In other words, is it worth anything if n is not infinity? Because all these results for, were for as n goes to infinity. But it turns out that that distributional assumption is a useful, or that distributional result is useful even for very moderate sample sizes. Let's say 100 will often work, but you can't say that with generality.